Well, I mean, when you give speeches, you like to find jokes to tell, so I was looking for jokes about climate change, believe it or not. The main joke about climate change, you can't find any jokes about climate change because it's too serious. But um, I found one, which I don't know if you've heard, and I don't know if you find funny, but I find quite funny, that there are two planets talking to one another, and one planet says to the other planet, I don't feel very well. I think I've got homo sapiens. And the second planet says to the first, don't worry, that doesn't last very long. <laughs> <laughs> These are the issues we're here to deal with today. Well, China, ladies and gentlemen, is a frontline country in terms of climate change, recognized as such by the Chinese government and all international observers of the country. Uh, just to take uh, one example of, of the already existing dangers, mountain glaciers are widely uh, melting. Those glaciers, for example, around the Tibetan Plateau supply a great deal of China's water. The water courses in China are crucial not only for Chinese history, but for the livelihoods of millions of Chinese people. The, the profile of the Chinese environment is already changing in, in itself disturbing and dangerous ways. Uh, much of this is documented uh, in China's own uh, climate change surveys and the vulnerability studies that the Chinese government has carried out. Against this backdrop, there is a kind of asymmetry, a kind of disjunction between the threats and dangers that China faces, along of course with all other parts of the world, and its trajectory of socioeconomic development. I think this will be familiar, familiar to everyone here. China overtook the United States as the world's biggest emitter of greenhouse gases about two years ago. Of course, you have to make certain provisos about this. If you look at per capita emissions, China is a long way uh, below the United States in terms of global greenhouse gases. And secondly, China is the manufacturing capital of the world. China is producing goods for most of the industrial countries. In the targets which uh, most of the industrial countries set themselves, and the achievements which they talk about as having re reached their carbon uh, reduction targets, uh, the factor of the transfer of manufacture to China is not included. It should be included because if this uh, industry were carried out in the Western countries, their carbon profile would look quite different. If you take the UK, for example, in the UK, in the UK, carbon emissions have gone down quite a lot since the beginning of the Kyoto period, 1990, mainly because of a transfer from coal-fired to gas-fired power stations. However, if you factor in the amount of manufacturing which has been transferred, to China especially, uh, emissions in this country have gone up quite steeply. So it's crucial to recognize this and there should be adjustments made in the targets which the developed countries are setting themselves and they don't have the right to lecture to China, especially on this issue. Nevertheless, you cannot accept China from the global attempt to limit carbon emissions on which, to me, the future of human civilization depends in this century. Therefore, it's very important that China is part of, contributes to wider global efforts to limit carbon emissions, and at the same time, takes advantage of the opportunities. There's a massive transition which has happened over the past five years in the literature on climate change and its relationship to innovation entrepreneurialism and economic activity. Until about five years ago, uh, containing climate change was almost universally seen as a cost. It was seen as a burden to bear. Now, partly because of the overlap between uh, cutting carbon emissions and increasing energy security, the emphasis has, has spread very strongly in the opposite direction. Now it's becoming clear all over the world that only those countries which are progressive in terms of environmental policy, only those countries which are in the vanguard 
in terms of leading the way through renewable sources of energy and other low carbon sources of energy are likely to be able to compete in the marketplace over the next 20 or so years. So competitiveness has replaced a simple factor of costs as a way of assessing a country's relationship to the climate change debate. So it's very important because it injects much more positive motivation, much more self-interest in creating an energy transformation than existed before. You cannot, you absolutely cannot underestimate the importance of this. Energy and climate change will be the two key problems for the next 40 or 50 years. We are talking not just, we're not, I mean, we're here to talk, I'm sure, about, you know, investing in solar energy in China, investing in wind power in China, and so forth. But against this backdrop, you have to think there is a much, much bigger issue, which is where most of the entrepreneurial activities and money to, make, to be made will in fact lie. This is, we're looking at a more or less total, longish term transformation of our energy system a long-term transformation of our dependent, from our dependence on fossil fuels to a more or less complete reversal of the dominant emphasis on energy production towards renewable and low-carbon technologies. This is like a sort of transformation of the very basis of industrial production. A lot of lifestyle change will go along with this, and as I'll argue in a minute, um, lifestyle change is one of the main areas where there's money to be made, Innovation is crucial. People make a big mistake when they concentrate only on technology, when they look for entrepreneurial activities. There is a vast, vast social economic agenda uh, beyond this, which will apply particularly to China because the, of the trajectory of its development so far. Well, the Chinese government is well aware of a range of these issues, I think, and become much more sophisticated in uh, trying to cope with them over the past few years. Um, there was a climate change plan announced in 2007 by the government, um, which was produced just before the G8 um, summit in 2007. It was a kind of breakthrough for Chinese government thinking um, because uh, what the Chinese government has done is set a target of a 40 to 45 percent improvement in energy efficiency by the year 2020. It's a pretty big um, transition in carbon efficiency. The efficiency in the use of energy, 40 to 45 percent improvement. You're talking radical change there. You're sort of talking revolution there, I think, in China's energy system. You have to recognize, however, that improving energy efficiency is not quite the same as controlling carbon emissions because energy efficiency only uh, is, part, is part of the issue. Um, how many cities you build, China's coming mega cities, you're going to talk about this afternoon, how many roads you build, how many cars you get on the road, these things can undermine gains you make in energy efficiency. Just to give you an example of that, um, Japan is about the most energy efficient country in the world but its carbon emissions have been increasing pretty steeply since 1990 simply because of continuing expansion of motor traffic, continued dependence of the economy on uh, high um, carbon producing industries and so forth. In its climate change plan, the Chinese government, um, I'm sure most people will be familiar with this, has got a kind of integrated program of action which involves uh, closing down the most inefficient coal-fired power stations and introducing carbon capture and storage, um, not just in the future, but immediately in some areas. I mean, the story goes around the world. The Chinese are building, you know, one coal-fired power station every week. Isn't this terrible? Well, nobody or very few people seem to look at what's going on in China in terms of closing down old plant, which more than compensates, um, even though it doesn't produce a radical change.